Hello. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm cold. I don't know if it's cold where you are, but God, it's been freezing here. Yeah. <laughs> I love your hair. Do you? Thank you very much. I'm very fond of it too. <laughs> it's really, really nice. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. That's your studio behind you there, is it? Yes. Yeah, it looks nice. All, all the, most of the canvases turn to the wall. <laughs> um, yeah, I can turn some for you if you like. <laughs> no, no, I'm laughing because it's it's um, a lot of artists do that. I do it as well, just to give myself a little rest. Uh, but they always look they look a little bit like um, children who've been a bit naughty, and it's like you go and face the wall now for a while, and I'll come back to you. And... <laughs> because they always create noise. And yeah. they, I, I prefer not to see the old painting to be able to create new ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, if you're listening, I'm talking to Sarah Shama in London. Did I pronounce your name correctly, Sarah? Yes. Good. And just to give you a time context for our conversation, today is Wednesday, the 14th of December, 14th of December, 2022. Very close to um, Christmas here. Now, um, Sarah, for someone listening who hasn't seen your work, how would you describe your paintings? Um, I don't know. <laughs> kind of figurative work that is um, with a hint of surrealistic uh, mood, let's say. And there is also contrast between uh, sometimes hyperrealism and the uh, abstract in the same work itself. And uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think you've covered it, covered it all. Very good. <laughs> and just to put your sensibilities, your artistic sensibilities in context, who are your creative heroes? Are they all painters or does it branch out to other fields? Mainly musicians, not painters. Okay. Painters for me are a source of knowledge, of information, let's say, or my homework. That's how I study. That's how I started yeah. by studying many painters, especially Rembrandt. He was one of the great painters that inspired me in a way when I was very young. And I learned a lot from him. But my main heroes now and even before are musicians because I love music, uh, like Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, these kind of people. Okay, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. I have the same birthday as Leonard Cohen. Really? And Van, yes, and Van Morrison. And I had a friend wow. who had the same birthday. So there was four people, all the same birthday. Yeah, I didn't know that. Really? Uh, yeah, Leonard Leonard Cohen and Van Morrison had the same birthday. Mm, and and I me. love Van Morrison as well. And you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're a painter also, right? Yeah, I am, yeah. Mm. Nice. Do you come Thanks. to London? Um I haven't been to London in a in a while. Um but I mm. I, I, I I've been, I have been. I have been to London many times. Next time when you come, you have to uh, call me and maybe we, you can come visit us and have something together, drink or dinner, whatever. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Hmm. Um, right. So how did you come to be an artist? What is your story, your your journey? It started when I was really young, like four or five. I think like all the children, they love to paint and draw. Uh, I I was like all these children who loves to paint and draw. And uh, I continue till now. My parents encouraged me a lot. And when I was uh, 14, uh, I realized that this would be my uh, career or my path. Because then I thought that I, would be, I am able to do anything I want in painting. So that's how I started when I was 14. And then I entered the 
uh, Institute of Fine Arts in Damascus for two years. And when I graduated, and I think I was 17 or 18, then I entered the Faculty of Fine Arts and I studied there four years, the uh, painting department. And that's how it all started. And that's, that was st still in Damascus, yeah? Yeah, I was still in Damascus. Yeah. I graduated uh, from the Faculty of Fine Art 1998, so a long time ago. Um, and then did you just make a natural transition into being a professional artist or was there some thing in between that? No, I, I think I started my professional career when I was still in the university. Sometimes some, I think I was in year two or year three, even year one. Uh, so I started very early and I... I consider myself, I used to consider myself professional artist, even when I was in, as a student in the university. Yeah. And when I graduated, I started to exhibit immediately and participate in exhibition in Damascus, in Lebanon, in the Middle East. So there's no gap. I've, all, I've always been a professional artist. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, like, I think that kind of attitude really helps, like the fact that you were thinking of yourself as a professional artist, even when you were still a student. Mm. I talked to other artists and they've had that similar kind of mindset and it seems to make it much easier to transition than the sort of story where the person gets through art school and then they're sort of, they emerge a bit dazed and then go, what do I do now? They seem to take longer to actually get going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And also because not all of the students enter art school uh, as as a real artist or uh, not all of them, when they enter, they have a real knowledge of art or let's say a lot of knowledge of art. Not They don't have most of them. So maybe that's why. And, and then University of if I want to talk about the Faculty of Fine Arts in Damascus, it's totally different than talking about any academy or university in the UK. Uh, because a lot of them, as I told you, they enter the faculty without any knowledge. They just, their marks in the baccalaureate gave them that they can only enter fine arts or something else. While in the UK, the students, they, uh, when they enter to any university, they were almost prepared to what kind of uh, university they want to enter. So they start to do art at school if they want to do art. So they, they prepare them from an early age, early age. So that's a big difference. Yeah. What was there much focus on um, classical kind of training in your? In your, in, when you were at university or was it more conceptual, that sort of side of things? Mm. Um, more, more classical than conceptual. So we used to uh, read and go to the um, uh, library or go to the internet and read about the contemporary arts that it was happening in the 90s because that's when I was in the university, but they used to teach us mainly in a classical way. Okay. So you drawing, painting, all those skills. Exactly. But also not very good because many students, they graduate from the university without uh, a, a proper knowledge about painting, drawing, or, or these skills also. So it's a... Uh, it was, you know, I don't want to criticize it a lot. It was fine, but uh, not enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how does the idea for a painting start for you? Like, how do you, are you a sketchbook person? Do you make little thumbnails? Do you write things? Like, is it more text? Do you make voice messages? How do you kind of capture those little wispy bits of inspiration that come? Uh, I don't do sketches 
Um, sometimes I take photographs, but um, I don't do sketches because I don't understand how to think about painting in advance. So for me, doing a sketch of a painting is like realizing it in my mind. And so it's done. <laughs> so there's no pleasure in, in creating it uh, physically. Yeah. I start always uh, without um, uh, any knowledge what the outcome will be. And that's uh, the joy of it. I'd love to surprise myself when I finish a painting. Uh, I love to discover something new. So that's why I don't uh, do so much preparation or sketches. And do you have a, do you start with an idea though of, oh, I want to do a painting about sorrow or I want to do a painting about joy, or do you just start with a blank internal canvas as well as an external canvas? Uh, sometimes I start with uh, just a blank canvas without anything. Like uh, I put myself in a state of mind as if I am um, totally ig ignorance. Is this the right word? Yeah. Ignore. So I put myself in a state of mind like if I don't know anything about painting and I start. It's, it, this is really interesting experience. Other times... Uh, as I told you, because I take a lot of pictures. So I browse and I look at my pictures and uh, one picture suggested something to me. So I start maybe with a, with a face or with a part of a body and then ended up with something totally different. Right. And the pictures that you take, are they staged? Like, do you get a model in and work with the model or are they just people that you see out and about or what prompts you to take the photos? Everything. So I use models, especially to paint the body. And uh, I take pictures of any people that might be inspiring to me and uh, also to anything, anything around me, sometimes a cloud, sometimes a, a certain kind of light. Sometimes the sky itself, the, the different uh, layer of the sky, it gives me another inspiration about, let's say, the background that I use in the painting. Uh, sometimes um, landscape. Also, sometimes I use it uh, in an abstract way. So anything, totally anything. Right. And then how does that approach work when you are putting together a like a body of work because you you've done like some huge or some big exhibitions um all around a central th theme um so like you had the one about modern slavery this latest one that you've just had i, I think it's to do with age uh, the, everything all the, the the paintings have got age in them so i'm guessing something yeah. to do with that so is that different when you're working to for you know a body of work uh, in usually, I don't work on a concept or on a subject, let's say. I just work, and when I finish, I think I'm done with this series. So I realize that there is a concept behind it. Ah, okay. Sometimes, yeah, like the last exhibition I've done, the one about age you, told, you just mentioned, I was interested about age. So I start working subconsciously uh, about the different age of man or of woman, whatever. And uh, when I'm done, when I'm, let's say, full from this idea, so the concept was um, complete. All right. So it's the same, really. You like It's the same as the way you paint. You, you haven't got it worked out beforehand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I think... I, that's how I approach anything. <laughs> That's how I approach life itself. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so I'm guessing then you don't make color studies before you start the main kind of painting? Color studies? Yeah. No, I don't. Nothing, nothing. I just uh, start on, on a white canvas. Uh, sometimes I start with the background. Sometimes I start with a line 
to start starting to draw something. Uh, and also, I always uh, start with uh, color, with uh, oil or acrylic, or but I don't, I don't use pencil or I don't use uh, charcoal to to draw anything yeah. before I. Start. Mm. Yeah, you have been doing quite a bit of drawing lately, though, haven't you? It's gone on your Instagram anyway. Yeah, yeah. I love to do drawings, but it's uh, it's a piece of art by itself, so it's not a preparation for something. Yeah, yeah, mm. or part of the process. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, we've had some questions come in on social media. This one's from um, Philemon Posters on Instagram. They say, hi, Sarah, I love your drawings. Have you ever worked with graphics? Greetings from Norway. Hmm. Nice questions. No, I haven't. I haven't. I'm I'm totally obsessed with painting and with uh, with drawing. And maybe I don't have time yet to do graphic, but uh, I don't find myself working in graphic. Thank you for the question. <laughs> so, what do you like to paint on? Uh, canvas or boards or what's your preference? Substrate wise. Uh, yeah, I prefer canvas. All kind of canvas. So sometimes I tried thin canvas, sometimes thick canvas. I I love canvas. It's it's this material by itself. It's really nice. And when I when I try to pick up different kind of canvas, it's like a small child trying to pick a chocolate. So it's uh, enjoyable for me <laughs> how I buy canvas and colors and brush everything. So all the these these are my materials. Very good. So I'm classical in a way. So how, when you're painting, uh, do you paint in many layers or is it all direct? Are you like just wet and wet the whole time or how does the actual painting process go? Uh, I paint in many layers, like maybe three, four layers, something like that per painting. And uh, sometimes I work on, even if I work on wet on wet, uh i some when i uh, i wait for it till finish and i sometimes add another layer on top of it so okay. mainly layers hmm. i and love to they... create this depth in in the painting through this different kind of layers yeah yeah are they are those layers transparent or opaque some of them transparent and sometimes opaque yeah okay do you have a favorite color palette that you always like to start off with uh you know i um i put all kind of colors on my palette which is it's a big palette but uh, i always find myself going to the crimson the red crimson and um, the the green sometimes also the dark green so these are my main colors in a way, but I use all kinds of colors, but I prefer red crimson always. <laughs> all right. And uh, I, as you said, you, you do acrylic and oil. Is there an acrylic phase or when does the acrylic come in? in yeah. Yeah, there is an acrylic phase. Face, you are absolutely right. <laughs> I I always work on oil, use oil, but uh, I started to use acrylic a uh, couple of years ago, not uh, not long time ago, just to try. And I love the way how acrylic, uh, especially when I work on uh, with with the big brush stroke and very opaque, op opaque, opaque or opaque. Yeah. Thick, opaque, opaque. Yeah. yeah. So the acrylic acrylic um, slides smoothly, and it uh, makes me work very quickly because I'm working wet on wet the acrylic. So this by itself, it's a very nice experience. But also, I don't finish only with acrylic. I work uh, another layer on top of it, and always it is in oil. So this contrast between these two materials. It's very interesting and create different kind of depth also to the painting itself. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to you have to do acrylic first. I, you can put oil on top of acrylic, but I don't think you can put acrylic on top of oil. No, you sure can't. Yeah. No. Because it will um what's the word when you it will dis, it will separate by time. Yeah, yeah. While the for... acrylic, the acrylic is a good base for oil. Yes. But the oil is not a good base for acrylic. There is they don't they don't uh, they don't merge together they separate by time yeah yeah mm. do you use black and if you do what kind of black and the same what kind of white do you use i use uh black yeah i use uh, lamp black ivory black uh also i use white a lot mainly titanium white uh I love black. It's one of my favorite colors also. It's not uh, very bright, <laughs> especially when you mix it with, with the green or with red or with purple, whatever. But I love it. I love this dull of the black color. It makes you imagine that there is many, many colors inside this black. Right. Yeah. Um, Evan Thomas Lilly in California says... If you had to spend a whole year painting with only two colors, a primary and an adjacent secondary, plus the grayscale, naturally, what would they be? Red and green. Crimson. <laughs> Crimson green. would be one of them. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have a particular medium that you like to use in your oil? Uh, I use turpentine. Uh, even if it's, the smell is very uh, strong, but I love this smell of it. And I use normal petroleum, like the the, the white uh, spirit, mm -hmm. which is less less without odor, without smell. And uh, recently, I started to use this orange medium. It's similar. It's something similar to turpentine, with a smell like one percent. No, not one percent. Ten percent comparing to the smell of turpentine. It's oh, really yeah. interesting. And it's, yeah. it has a nice smell also, like orange. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's made out of orange mm. peels or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very good. Okay, but where do you get that? I, I, I dilute it with uh, with white spirits sometimes. It's it's thick for me. Okay. I get, I get it from the color from uh, this uh, the, the, the shop that they sell, sell colors and brushes and... From the art materials shop. <laughs> okay. Jackson art materials, I think. I don't remember which one. And um, do you have a preference for brush shape and um, length? Uh, I use very big brushes, like the same brushes that the, the painter who paint the house use it. I love this kind of brushes a lot. And uh, of course, I use all kinds of brush. I have total, uh, totally, I don't know how much, but all kinds of brushes from very thin to very thick and uh, hard. So not much preference, but when I always think about brushes, I think about the big one. Oh, okay. And you said you had a big palette. What kind of a palette do you have? Is it glass? Is it wooden? It's a glass. Very practical. Yeah. Do you have a, a color underneath it or anything? The, it is glass on a white, on a white surface. On white. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I clean it every day. <laughs> yeah. I love good for, it. Good yeah. for you. <laughs> Just cleaning the palette is something in enjoyable, <laughs> yeah. especially when you scratch it with this uh, kind of blade, special blade that's used on the glass. You know which one. I don't know yeah, what's yeah. its name in English. <laughs> uh, well, it, well, I use a kind of a scraper, Any, anything that... Scraper, worked. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, other than the brushes, do you use palette knives or any other kind of things to make marks when you're painting um i use cloth sometimes uh i use i don't use palette knife 
But a lot of times I use a small blade, you know, that's the, the blade that it's fixed in a, like a, in a pen. They use yeah. it uh, for, for small work, for de de small decorative works. So I use it to create lines, to scrap the paintings, to, to scrap the painting after uh, it's completely dry, to, to create a special line that it is, uh, it looks very white and very sharp. I love this line. I think you can see it in some of my paintings, most of my painting. It creates yeah. some, some kind of distance between the line itself and the, and the painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you check yourself as you're painting? Like um, some artists will use a lot of mirrors or they'll turn the painting upside down or they'll take pictures on their phone or they'll be sort of going back and forth the whole time, or they'll get their friends in to give them critiques. What, what kind of things do you do? Uh, I go back and forth, like the normal things. Uh, I use mirrors also. I try to see it in the opposite way while, while looking at the mirror, so I see the reflection of it. And uh, what else? Uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Very simple. <laughs> What's your uh, varnishing preference? Uh, I use the, the normal gloss uh, varnish, but uh, it's not very glossy it's because I dilute it with the white spirit. And this is the, just the normal thing that I use. And sometimes I don't use varnish at all because the paint itself create like, uh, because of the many layers that I use, uh, the paint itself become varnish, nor varnished, uh, in a normal way because of the different layers on the many layers that I use and a lot of mediums on top of each other. Right. Uh, what kind of lighting setup do you have in your studio? I have, uh, I don't, sorry, this is my computer. I don't know how to, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't like to use the uh, normal light. Uh, I love uh, to to use uh, not not very strong light like the but the normal artificial light in the studio. So I don't use daylight. I use artificial light, and it's not very bright. And sometimes I work uh, in a little bit of dark atmosphere because I uh, in that way my painting creates lights itself. So when I work in dark. Not, not totally dark, but just one small light, uh, the painting become lighter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I... Um, Very... Yeah, that's it. That's an interesting way of doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to anything as you're working? Do I listen to? Sorry? Music, podcasts, audiobooks, TV... I listen to music all the time while I'm working, all the time. So, as I told you, I love blues music, hard rock music. I love Sufi music also from Pakistan, from India, some Sufi music from the Arab world. Uh, yeah, I love, I love this kind of music, the music that take you away, that uh, puts you in a state of mind where you are totally relaxed or totally in, in a dream state. That's how I love to be all the time. <laughs> Very good. How do you name your paintings? Um, I don't name most of them, but the, the ones that I named them, I just sit in front of the painting and wait for the name to appear and find the name. <laughs> Very good. So the net, the painting tells you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Um, Bay Welly in San Diego says, thank you, uh, John, for your great podcast. So inspiring. And thank you for always bringing amazing artists. You're welcome, Bay. Sarah, I love your work. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you make the faces in some of your paintings look malleable and almost as if they're moving? 
do you edit the reference photo and distort the subject uh, in it first or do you distort it while you're painting and use your imagination for however you want it to look? Uh, I distort it uh, while I'm painting. I don't use uh, I don't use an S like don't use computer or something to distort it because I love to see how my my uh, my mind will distort any face and uh, sometimes it look moving because i work many faces on top of each other cr to create a movement back to the layers again so paint the first face maybe facing the viewer and the second face will be uh, in a transparent layer <clears throat> moving his head or whatever and distorting the figure, it's, it's always a big joy for me to do. Because also, I, I play this game with my eyes when I look at anyone, at any person. Or when, I look, when I walk in the street, when I look at any object, I always uh, try to distort it in my eyes. So I always try to imagine how things will dissolve, how things will melt, how things will move how things will fly will float so it's a, it's a game i love to play it all the time and i do it in my work <laughs> well, that's lovely matab mohammadi in los angeles says john i appreciate your time and hard work to produce this amazing show i'm a big fan and never miss any episodes thank you for inviting sarah sarah you're uh, welcome matab um Congratulations for your achievements, Sarah. Would you please explain to us your daily routine in your studio? Uh, I start in the morning, enter the studio in the morning, uh, start to pick some music to listen to, and uh, start working immediately on my canvas or on my white canvas if I want to start a, a new painting or on uh, the painting that I have started it days before. Uh, so I work for a couple of hours, maybe four or five hours, something like that. And then uh, continue my normal life. Uh, children will come from school, uh, doing my, uh, my other part of uh, personality as a mother, uh, taking care of some emails, uh, some interviews, some meetings, things like that. And um, during the night, if I'm not out, if I'm not out for dinner or things, so I work for another couple of hours, uh, maybe from 9 till 12 or 1, something like that. All right. <laughs> Uh, Stephen Cavallo on Instagram says, noticed that Sarah did a beautiful portrait of Bob Dylan and said that he has influenced her for 30 years. He's been a huge influence in my art as well since I was 11 years old. I'm 66 now. Can you tell us more about how he and any other poets, musicians and writers have played a part in your work? Very, very glad to hear that. <laughs> that he started to inspire him from him was 11 really nice uh i the first time i listened to bob dylan i was 14 and i was um, my father used to love music a lot he uh, he once played bob dylan record so i uh, was totally amazed and i started to ask him question who's this guy why what is he saying what is he many 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 questions <laughs> then he so I started my love, my love to Bob Dylan start when I was 14. And uh, simply because I listened to his music, uh, this is the only inspiration and the main inspiration that I've got in my painting. Okay, I did many portraits of him all over the years, something like 40, 50, I don't know, but a lot of portraits of him. And there is uh, a lot of portraits. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so for me, I love his face a lot. He's very expressive. The thing that I love the most about Bob Dylan is he's very real and rough, and he doesn't he doesn't care about anything except his his own voice, his art, his 
his own thing that he's doing. And this is really rare and I admire it. Uh, listen to his music in my studio most of the time. Uh, put me in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good state of mind that uh, makes the creation very interesting. So he, he influenced me this way. Sometimes I used to use some of his words on my paintings, like a small sentence. I'm talking 50 years, 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, Leonard, Leonard Cohen also, I love his, uh, his, his uh, poetry. Uh, so all these musicians, it's mainly Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like, um, like some artists, they like to have all the works of uh, other artists around that inspire them in their studio. Um, but then other artists don't like to have that kind of influence, um, visual influence. Uh, but it sounds like there's something about um, Bob Dylan's music and Leonard Cohen's music and poetry that it's sort of helping you. It's like speaking to your artistic uh, inspiration or, you know, it's like listening to somebody that's inspiring but it's not going to influence you visually, but kind of keeps the spirit of it, of where they're coming from, authenticity, truth, alive. That's what it sounds like. Is that the case? I think so. And, and also because I want to communicate with a viewer. I want my art to communicate with a viewer, not, uh, not in words, not in thinking, just in feeling. So I think music reach your subconscious through your ears. And same, I want my painting to reach subconscious of your viewers through your, through your eyes. So that's how I see uh, a relation between <clears throat> art and music. <clears throat> and when I started to listen to Bob Dylan, I couldn't understand English back then. Same now I listen to Pakistani music. I don't understand anything. But I just love the feeling. I love the <clears throat> the feeling of it. So that's yeah. how I want my art to give to any viewer. Yeah, me too. I'm the same with, with music. I listen to music from all around the world and I haven't a clue what, what they're saying. And in a way, mm. I don't I don't really want to know what they're saying because I think it'll kind of ruin it. It might ruin it, you know. They might be singing about yes. something I you know whereas I'm I'm getting something different. Exactly. But yeah, no, I know what you mean. Smell is the same. Smell can just communicate something yeah. uh, directly mm. in a way that uh, it sort of bypasses your conscious mind. Yeah. Exactly. Take yeah. you back in time, the smell, or, or make you feel that you are living some new experience that you haven't lived before when you sm smell something. Yeah. It's very, very um effective this kind of memory that the smells create yeah it's um it's strange isn't it that there isn't an art form to do with smell you know like <laughs> like, like there you know sound we've got music visual we've yeah. got our art even tactile you could say sculpture is like to do a touch yeah. And exactly. then cooking, all the, you know, there's artists who, who are cooks, mm. you know, they can make amazing things and that taste amazing. But you don't hear about any art to do with that, you know, any avenue of art that's just to do with smell that I have, that I know of. Have you ever heard of anything like that? No, I don't think so. But sometimes the smell is, they use it with many things, but not as a major form of art. Let's start to create a new movement, a new art movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's there's yeah. perfumery, perfumery is listening now who are going, what about us? We make perfume. That's, <laughs> our, you know, that's an art form. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. it's, uh, it's yeah, uh, like li li listening to them and how they do it. It is. It's very technical. But yeah, it's, it's, not, really, it's not really considered an art though, is it? I'm sure they do, but. You know. Amazing how how they uh, subtract or bring the the perfume from anything. It's it's 
it's for me it's totally amazing it's kind it of is. an art form for me yeah 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 um ricardo garcia on twitter says hi john thanks for the opportunity you're welcome ricardo my question for sarah um, don't you think that after the 19th century, the artist has gotten a bit lost and on the way to re rediscover himself towards the second half of the 20th century, he spread out in generating a supposed originality or identity through pictorial effects and excessive gestures, which tend to cover up that it is empty of the message or the story that painting can tell us. <laughs> Uh, I think paintings, there's always like uh, a circle. We start with things, then we finish it, then we start to look for something else when, when we are empty, then we find another form of painting. So it's like a circle, like anything in this history. But also uh, the market, the art market, it's a huge now. It's bigger than the artists themselves. So the art markets, when when it's huge and this business is totally flourishing, I'm talking recently or last, uh, let's say, last 70 years or something like that, that will create a huge emptiness in the, in the arts itself. And artists will become lost they're not doing their own things only. <clears throat> They're trying to do what the markets want. I don't know if I understand his question right. Did I? I hadn't a clue. I was really hoping you would understand it because I, it sort of... <laughs> well, let's go through it. Okay. Do you think that after the 19th century, the artist has gotten a bit lost? And on the way to re rediscover himself towards the end of the 20th century, he spread out in generating a supposed originality or identity through pictorial, f uh, pictorial effects and excessive gestures. Um, I don't know if I agree with them. Do you? Um, not much. <laughs> okay. And then but the last I, bit I is... The question, maybe, maybe my English is not perfect to, to be able to understand it. I still didn't understand the question well. But what I tried to understand or what I think about the changing in the art history, that, okay, there is art masters and there is very good artists. And then there is, let's say, we go through impressionism and then after impressionism to surrealism and things like that. And then, then, then abstract and then conceptual art and then some people go back to uh, a kind of new figure at new figure figuration something like that. yeah so if i want to talk about it like this just to describe what's happening but i don't think artists get lost uh, every artist in his career he might feel that he's lost or he's he feels he's nothing or he's not doing anything but Talking about the art movement, it's, it's like a normal change. And now there is the, the digital art. And so life is full of change. I don't think any anything, any art movement, or let's say we, since we are talking about painting, I don't think painting is, is dying. I'm trying to understand the question, by, by the way. I'm trying to answer anything that's to be related to the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think he's the rough gist of what he's saying is that, you know, in the move away from from figurative work um, mm. into, as you say, abstract and then conceptual, that as it's that that the whole that figuration got a bit lost. I think this is what he's saying here. Mm. And that now that it's coming back, it's. Um, there's too much focus on pictorial effects and, and excessive gestures, um, mm. which are trying to uh, be contemporary and in a way are losing the what, what painting could be. Um, I think that's what the question is. I'm not saying that I agree with him, but I think that's what he's asking. Mm. I don't agree. I don't agree. Because yeah. of this, uh, 
computer and because of the social media and because of all this development, the, the digital development, this will affect art for sure. If, if maybe he's thinking that this is making art artificial, maybe that's what he, he is talking about, or that's yeah. what make art figuration and make it artificial or in a way, but no, I don't agree. Yeah. But thank you for the question. At least uh, we <laughs> we talk a lot about anything to try to cover part of yeah. this question. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, Ricardo. And um, if we didn't answer it well, um, ask it again to, to the next person I'm talking to, and we'll we'll uh, we'll have another go. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fellow in real life, I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part, at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton, gently does it, all one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely and I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to so it's all lovely so if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month you can do that through patreon i'd really appreciate it it makes a huge difference to me um you mentioned uh, your children um how have you found balancing being an artist and being a parent just practically like are there any tips that you can uh, pass on that you found are really helpful or helped you Mm. Um, the only the major thing is when you decide to bring children to this world uh, they have to be part of your passion so for me having children is it was long time ago my passion to, to create children see them how they are growing so it's a it's a big joy to me if it's not like this it might uh, affect the art career because if it's it is a passion and it's really something i love to do it so i am able to disconnect myself from them anytime i want to go through my uh, craziness in creating this all this art and uh, able to organize my time in a not organize my time able to think about time differently so we have 24 hours per day. I think I have, I, I try to feel and think that I have 50 hours per day. <laughs> so how you feel, how you think about time, it will give you. So it needs, uh, yeah, it needs power. It needs um, acceptance and uh, passion. Nurture your passion more to be able to do this balance. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. I hadn't thought about it like that, but yeah, that's very good. Mm. Um, tell me about your moral fiber. Moral fiber? Yeah. You, you mean, uh, give me, uh, explain to me. So oh, okay. Moral, I understand. Moral it, fiber. It, I don't moral fiber. Question. Isn't that the name of the scarf um, project that you're involved oh. in? <laughs> I totally forgot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought okay, it's such a good name. Really nice. <laughs> <laughs> good name. <laughs> but I was thinking that you are uh, suggesting any any expression about morals. Or... <laughs> yeah. So it's a uh, it's a very nice and interesting uh, project that uh, my great art my great art they are like a company that do charitable work through art and 
they are always doing very interesting um, uh, concepts uh, as a charity. So they, they sell art to support charities, but they always do it in a very creative way because the organizer, the owner of this charity, Simon Butler, and the, the head of this charity, he's an artist himself. Uh, so they are very creative. Now they collaborate with this uh, Love Welcome, and they are uh, like a small company also. Uh, they gather women, especially uh, refugee women from all over the world, and they give them this job. These women, what they do, they sue, and they, uh, the right sue is, is, is uh, the word sue is right, right? Uh, they, to uh, sew, they sew the... The, the fabric and yeah yeah so they they knit and they sew and they do things with fabric uh, for this uh, love welcome and they sell their products and they get benefit from it so it's very interesting uh, company this love welcome and uh, migrate art they collaborated with love welcome to create the scarves and uh, they collaborated with two, three, two, with four artists, four female artists. I'm one of them uh, to design these scarves. So I decided to use uh, one of my. Um, I have like a series of paintings called uh, oil sketches. So I decided to use one of them, and uh, they are selling selling this uh, scarves to benefit for the benefit of. Uh, many charity that they are supporting uh, it's beautiful uh, project and i i really like it yeah 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 the scarves look great and the all the the artists you're the four of you are very different which is nice mm. it's, you know it's not exactly it's nice variety yeah mm. yeah i know uh, chloe early i don't know her personally but she's a irish or her her um they're from herself and her husband are from ireland originally Mm. So. Nice. I don't know um, the, the artists, but I, I've heard about them, but I don't know them personally. Yeah, well, yeah. me neither. Well, apart from mm -hmm. you. Um, <laughs> what's the last piece of art you bought? I bought yeah. um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I have some pieces of art from friends from uh, that I bought in Syria, but he, here in London I haven't bought any real piece of art recently. Okay. Um, okay, this is my desert island question. All right, so you're mm -hmm. on a desert island. Um, all your your food and your shelter are all taken care of. There's, that's not you're not going to have to spend any time doing that. And you've got any kind of art supplies that you would like. Um, but no one's coming. You're on a desert island. It's just you. Would you still paint even though no one will ever see it, what you make? I think so. I still paint because it's uh, it's the only thing that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I paint. <laughs> I paint uh, for the hope. That someone will come and see it, even if you said no one will come and see it. <laughs> There's okay. always someone will come. <laughs> someone will find but it someday. I paint, I, I paint for myself if I don't yeah. if I don't have to show it to. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think your paintings would be much different to the way they are now? If I'm in desert island, it might but it might be nicer without any uh, any social influence. Okay, I try mm. to disconnect myself in the studio without any influence, social influence or market influence or anything. That's what I always try to do. But if I'm in a really desert island, something else will appear, I'm sure. Would love yeah. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, if there was one uh, main underlying theme to all your work, what do you think it would be? One main online theme to to all your work. Ah, uh, um, uh, you mean describe my work in one thing? That's what you want me to do. Well, when you think about all your 
all your paintings that you've ever made um mm. Nice, simple question. Um, yeah. d does it, um, do you think there's a one kind of underlying theme that you, you know, continually, yeah. is a thread it's running it's through them all? It's me, it's my life. It's, it's, it's exactly everything I'm living. So it's kind of a self-portrait, all my work. Right. You can see, okay. you can see my biography in my work. That's what I, I can see all the years and every details I can see it in my work. Okay. Is that because you can look at a painting and go, oh yeah, I can remember where I was when I painted that. Or it's the actual content of the painting. You can go, oh yeah, that's the way I was feeling. That painting is a representation of what was going on for me and how I was feeling when I painted that. Uh, yes, the feeling more, more than the where I painted it or yeah how, okay. how i painted it the feel but also also i remember when i paint when or where i painted it i remember some when i look to an old painting i immediately uh, receive a fe special feeling about it but yeah. not is by the way not necessarily the same feeling every time i look to an old painting i see it differently yeah because right yeah it's, it's like going back to your memory and look at yourself when you were 20 or 19 or whatever you see a different personality in the same in the same moment in the same spot in the same things yeah yes um, <laughs> i agree <laughs> um scarves finest persian on instagram says how do you feel about your bond with older works do you miss the ones that are no longer with you? Nice questions. Uh, I don't have bonds with older works because I think if I kept this bond with it, I won't be able to create a new work. So I have to get rid of the old work from my mind to be able to create something new. That's why you see my paintings here on the wall are turned upside down. I don't want to remember them. But uh, I, I, I enjoy and I uh, have a special feeling whenever I see an older work that, uh, that was sold in a, in, a, in a person place or in a house or whatever. It gives me very nice feeling because it takes me back in time in a way and to the future in the same way so it it shakes me i love yes. this yeah yeah uh katie voigt in massachusetts says does uh, sarah have any stories in her career when her work got rejected or not accepted and how she worked through that it's not always about success but also how to overcome failures thank you good questions um to think about it well I don't remember because I always look toward the toward the, because the, I, I always think and look and to the best let's say or to the top that it's not existed I'm, I'm looking over the top most of the time that's why I don't remember uh, this rejection or bad things that affect my career. I haven't had many things, many bad rejection or many intents that really destroy me or... I don't remember I have because also I was very, very lucky since I was really young. As I told you, my parents supported me a lot. And when I was in the uh, University of Fine Arts in my second year, third year, my parents opened a gallery for to support me. And so I immediately gain a big name in Damascus. So I was very lucky, but also very passionate about my work. And in the same time, I'm a very positive person. I don't think about bad things. For sure, there's many things happen, but I don't think about it and I don't remember it. That's how I deal with it. If it's this, ask, answer her question. Deal with yeah. it is to forget about it as if, yeah. it's, as if it's not happened. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. I think, particularly considering like 
you're from Syria and mm. um, you know all the very difficult things that have gone on in Syria and you're now um, you, like you had to leave Damascus for a period and you now live in London so considering that that you know that 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 context let's just to put a bit of context if you're listening around that answer <laughs> because there are mm -hmm. other people who could have had the same things happen to them and that they would be defined by those things rather than the um expression of gratitude that you just gave there for all the good things that have happened to you exactly but also to i I left Syria, but just to correct your, uh, I left Syria in 2013. I went to Lebanon be because of the war. It wasn't easy to stay there. Yeah, but yeah. then I decided to move to London, not because of the war, because I, I wanted to continue my career here. So I moved to London because of that. So I got something called exceptional talent visa to live and work in the UK. And I still go back and forth to Syria. <laughs> every two months yeah I, I saw that yeah yeah well just so, to yeah no I, I knew that that you hadn't I knew that you hadn't gone to London because of the thing I was going to ask you about the um, special talent visa because as my mother would say or used to say they were they're like hen's teeth have you ever heard that expression no hen's teeth hen you know like a hen like a uh, bird hen. hens yeah. they're like hen's teeth I don't know uh, what it means. You know the way you, you know the way you hear these expressions your whole life, and you just you absorb them. And I, you know, like when I stop to kind of go, what does that actually mean? I don't know. I don't think hens hens have teeth. But anyway, that's the sort of thing my mother would say. Hens teeth. They're like hens teeth, meaning they're very very rare. So for you to be yeah. able to get that says a lot. Um, and then yeah, how are things in Syria now? Uh it's it's fine the war almost stopped especially in damascus because i'm from damascus mm. so there's nothing there there's no war it's fine but the economical situation is in a mess it's not it's not easy so people some people are suffering mm. it's it's not it's not a normal situation yet but when you go there if you go to damascus you will see normal city people are going out Everything is known in a way, but of course, many people are suffering from the lack of economy, from the lack of electricity, the lack of many things. But hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> things will get better. I think it yeah. is getting better, little by little. Yeah. Is there a lot of rebuilding going on or has that started yet? Not on a major scale. Like uh, yeah. every person is trying to fix his house, but not on a major, major yeah. project. It needs a major project because half of the country is destroyed. Half of it. If you go, let's say, if you go to Aleppo or to Homs or to uh, the suburban area around Damascus, it's on the ground. It's surprisingly, it's yeah. amazingly surprisingly. It's something. It needs. Uh, countries and i don't know it needs a big big project yeah right not yeah. yeah did you um i when was it now 2017 i uh, had uh, shireen atassi on uh, talking about the atassi foundation did you know that family um of course yeah i know muna muna atassi from yeah. damascus and i know shireen well so we know them I know them since I'm in the university. Yeah, they oh, are nice. doing great. They are really they doing. Are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, they now they are based in Dubai. They are working from Dubai, so they are yeah. really doing. Mm. Yeah, that's where I met um, Shireen. I wandered into the uh, Atassi Foundation, the gallery they were having. Um, I was very hot, <laughs> so I think I just stood there in the air conditioning for about five minutes to like cool down, and then. Yeah, it was a fantastic exhibition. Uh, yeah, I think the last exhi the exhibition that they did in Dubai, in somewhere in a Circle Avenue, right? Not in their gallery, in a, in a new venue that was open recently, I think something like that. But it was very interesting exhibition, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah have you seen their collection have you seen have you, i think that's what it, the the thing i went to was was they had a, a um the whole show was um works from their collection that they collected over the years so yeah. it was kind of his, historic syrian art um and then right mm. through to contemporary it's great yeah yeah mm. they are great i've seen a lot of their collection since they, they were in in syria because Mona Tassi, she used to have a gallery in Damascus. So yeah. the gallery was one of the, I think, one of the first galleries that opened. So yeah, she used to exhibit a lot of from her collection. And uh, I know all these artists. So she has a great collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's nice. They're very involved with the diaspora of Syrian artists in Europe. Do you have much contact yeah. with other Syrian artists who are uh, are not in Syria anymore? Yeah, the same. Because when we were in Syria, you, you're talking about 10, 11, 12 years ago that many of the artists went left Syria. So mm. when I was in Damascus, we, we all know each other. So some of them older, some of them younger, some of them, but kind of the same generation. So I know all of them, but I'm not in, still in contact with a lot of them because we lost our contacts because we, were, we weren't that very close. But yes, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. And how have you found transitioning into the London art world? Because one of the things I was really impressed with looking at your Instagram was you seem really well connected with like the UK art world and different, you know, trusts and things going on. It's like you're, you look like you're everywhere, but that's just Instagram, I know, but you're involved in a lot of different things. Yeah, because I uh, always used to come to London and exhibit here since long time ago, since I think since 2004, when I won this uh, BP Portrait Award, when I won the fourth prize in the BP mm -hmm. Portrait Award, 2004. So since then, even before I came to exhibit in 2001 also, but mainly since the 2004, I had, uh, I started to, to build connection with the art world. So I met many people uh, in the art world, the museum directors, artists, things like that. And I continue my relationship with them till now. And uh, that's why I decided to move because I already has uh, some friends in the art world. I have some connection that it, is, it will be very helping, uh, helpful to me. So, and, and I, I continue meeting other artists, uh, uh, get involved with some institutions, with some exhibitions, with many things. So I'm, that's what I have to do since I'm living here. <laughs> I can't live yeah. here without, without being not involved 100%. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's, it's normal. Okay, it's tiring a little bit. You have to make effort. You have to go to many places, invite people. There's a, there's a work has to be done. Not yeah. like uh, when you were in Syria. You, things happening by its own. <laughs> Here you have to do things. You have to 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 keep to keep relationships with people. Don't forget their name. <laughs> so there's a work to be done. But it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's John. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can read it on my my screen. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. It'd be good if if you had something like that on a when you're like in, in real life when you're out and about. Like, oh yeah, I can just see what their name is. Um, yeah, you have sort of your the. And you can tell me if this is right or not, but it looks like the art, the, you know, like we say the art world, but it's lots of different villages and different, you know, it's not just one thing. Um, yeah. And a, a lot of the artists that I talk to um, who are figurative artists like you, um, they are not really in the broader kind of contemporary art world. They're a little bit, um, you know, they're kind of accused of, you know, be a bit backward or just not really included in the current conversation or some you know this is the kind of thing that, that would be said to them 
Um, it seems like you have transitioned into that world um, somewhat. And um, I'm wondering if there are any things that you've observed that other artists maybe are not doing to help themselves be more included in that broader um, contemporary art world. Mm. You mean uh, what you're asking me to suggest what to do if to be to be for the artist to be included in this contemporary scene? That's what you. Yeah, it seems like um, there's a you know quite a thriving little um, village of contemporary of contemporary figurative artists who are very interested in classical, you know, work. Traditional. Who, traditional yeah and but they don't seem to get outside that into the you know like yeah they might you might have some other work at art basel or something like that but they're certainly not getting the price the same prices it's much lower the price of their work and they don't they don't have that kind of acceptance and you know you seem to have gone into that world more so i'm just wondering you know if you've observed what I'm talking about and if you could see what you've done differently that other artists are maybe not doing mm. um, I don't I think I haven't uh, uh, I haven't felt this in my career for me but uh, maybe I can see here in the UK that many good figurative artists, they're not taking the right attention. I can see this uh, because as you say, they're not included in the art fairs. They're not, uh, uh, they're not playing the game. They're not playing because the game. They are very good. Exactly. I think because they are very good artists, because they are very, they know exactly the right technique and how to, to paint properly. These kind of people usually they're not very good in marketing themselves because they are very good in doing art. But a yeah. lot of artists who are doing bad art, <laughs> they are very good in marketing themselves because they're not do good in doing art. So okay. this is so is, they're good at they're good at playing the game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, great. So, so what's the game, Sarah, and how did how do they play it? <laughs> You have to be able to understand business in art and to be a real artist. And there is a big difference between the two. It's not easy to put them together in one personality. As I told you, I, 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 I was supported a lot by my family in this, in, from this, from I was very young in understanding the art market. So I grew up understanding the art market and with the, and, and, the, and also this artist has to, has to have the courage to, to say that this is a, a bad art, this is a, a garbage, this is okay. The, 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 all the art fairs, many, many good galleries, they are exhibiting garbage, yes, of course. <laughs> the good artists, especially the figurative ones, they have to, to, be, to, to, be, uh, to, to let themselves, permit themselves to say this. And when they are really able to say that this is bad, this is blah 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 i'm not good in marketing i have to find somebody who is very good in marketing or i have to learn how to market myself that's when they they be more included in the contemporary art scene that's what i think because meeting so many artists the artists that are doing rubbish they are clever and glamorous and they talk and they know how to present themselves and they know how to market themselves while the good artists that i met they are shy and 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 uh, and very nice and they don't know how to market themselves so i think this is the main uh, uh, problem that we have to think about it they have to think about it i think so mm. so and you and you may not be able to answer this or you may not want to answer this but the um <laughs> <laughs> that part of that problem seems to me to come down to the collectors and the collectors insecurity about their own artistic choices so i have i suspect that a lot of collectors will look at something that just visually appeals to them 
which might be a very traditional figurative painting or it might not. Yeah. But if there are art experts in inverted commas around them who are going, no, that's old. You want to look at this thing over here. This is really cool. This is the, this is hot. This is the latest thing. And the, if the collector is insecure about their own artistic vision, they'll kind of go, well, I kind of like that older one, but okay, these guys who seem to know, these people who seem to know what they're talking about um, and they're from very, you know, big name galleries are telling me this is good art, then, yeah, I suppose I should just listen to them and buy that. Exactly. That's what's happening. That okay. is what's exactly happening, especially when a collector wants to pay a certain amount of money, especially when it's involving with uh, uh, investment, when, when art becomes an investment. So the collector, mm. he thinks and he knows that he's, he does, he's stupid, even if he loves this kind of work, and the gallery will tell him, no, no, this is uh, there's no future for this artist. Even mm. if you love his work and admire it, and the expert or the gallery say, no, there's no future because uh, uh, his prices at uh, certain auction houses are going down, blah, 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 blah. To talking to him about the, the real market. So thinking about art as an investment is totally different things than yeah, uh, yeah. buying the thing that you love. But uh, th this is the game that I am talking about. The consultant, the art galleries, the dealers, all these people are playing in the market. They're not, they're, not, uh, uh, they're not giving you the best art ever. They're not presenting you with all with the best artists. They are grabbing the market and they are following some trends and they are following some political trends sometimes. So they, they, the market, it's it's something totally separated than creating a real art. And I think good figurative artists, they are now, I think they are the best artists. They should be able to try to understand or try to play this game or maybe uh, work with somebody who can play this game. It's not easy, yeah. but that's what they sh should do. Yeah. Because they yeah. don't want to be just like a traditional painters, traditional artists who does only portraits or who do just uh, 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 traditional uh, commissions or things like that. Yeah, it sounds like as well as the artists getting a bit more open to that kind or being a bit more open to that uh, way of thinking, it sounds like that what's needed is um, a change or a new type of art expert or advisor to be able to connect the gallery uh, sorry to be able to connect the uh, painter or the artist with the collector and and to say to to be able to kind of inform the collectors with the with the same amount of impressive credentials you know you know you were right the first one that you liked yeah it is good you know like to pr pr be able to promote figurative art um in that way that you're talking about. Exactly. And I think now we are seeing a lot of figurative artists that they are appearing in the art fairs and in the major uh, art events. So figurative art is, is back in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming. People tired. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, what sort of price range are your paintings selling for these days? Uh, something between, um, let's, if a painting one meter, one meter twenty centimeter, it is uh, twelve thousand uh, uh, pound. Because I always pound. think between pound and dollar. Yeah. And something bigger, like um, maybe two meters and a half with two meters. This is I have this pra this size. I love it. It's very big. So it will be like forty five thousand. Um, okay. Also. Yeah. Very good. And do you do um, everything yourself, like your social media, your PR management, you know, emailing, all that kind of thing, or do you have people to help you with that? No, I'm I'm very bad in this. I have people help me 
<laughs> have people help you. Yeah, I need. Hey, I think you need, Jan. You need someone to help you with this. Uh, especially, as you say, management. Sh ship, ship the paintings to another country for an exhibition. Receive this. Uh, some financial things like the... Uh, a lot of things. So I'm, I'm not good in it at all. I have people who help me. Yeah. Well, it's great. They're doing a great job because I was looking at, you know, I've been looking at your work. I've been looking at all the different things and your social media is lovely. It's all very congruent across the different platforms. You are seem to be doing so many different things and you've got so many different shows and projects going on. And you've got your family as well. I was like, wow, this is exactly. amazing. <laughs> well, one person is doing all this i well that's pretty amazing yeah. if she is but i um, i hope not <laughs> because you wouldn't have much life left <laughs> um do you have a big art dream you'd like to achieve before you die a big art dream i have uh the repetitive dream and the only dream that I always dream about is to keep creating in the same enthusiast that I have now and uh, have a good health <laughs> to be able to keep creating. That's it. Very simple dream. <laughs> Very good. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you're facing at the moment as an artist? Hmm the biggest challenge i don't know i think every day there is a challenge i yeah. don't have the biggest challenge to tell you the truth yeah i don't have no one big one mm. all right just just the normal the normal small ones yeah. <laughs> mm. um okay this is my last question I, I ask this to everyone who comes on the podcast if there's one thing yeah. you could pass on to future generations what would it be um just do the thing you love and uh, uh, dedicate yourself to it and focus on it and uh, you will get anything you want in life very simple <laughs> but it's not easy to to to, uh, to do <laughs> yeah oh that's brilliant that's very good um okay well um, I really like your paintings. Uh, I really enjoy them. Um, there's something, um, I don't know how to describe it, but you seem, they seem multidimensional to me, your paintings, on lots of different levels. Like uh, you, see, you, you do the very difficult thing of managing to combine lots of different ways of painting into one painting, which yeah. if, and if you've ever tried it, it's not easy to do and pull off. Um, but you manage, like you go from very fine, um, I wouldn't call them hyper-realistic. They're, they're much more atmospheric than hyper-realism for me. Um, but yeah. very kind of identifiable, kind of um, almost classical looking kind of elements. Mm. And then you'll have very strong brushwork. Uh, other other parts will have very strong um, impasto, very strong brushwork, uh, very full of energy. And they will, and then the abstract elements, and then lines, and then marks. You know these these white lines that you cut into it as well, which. You know, if I said to, if I gave that as an assignment to someone here, do this. I want you to put all this in one painting. You know, they just, they just end up pulling their hair out. Yeah, um, but you manage to do it, um, and it kind of works. And not only that, but you do that like technically. Um, so the the technical narrative is very strong, but it it's it's so linked to the the pictorial narrative, like what you're saying in the painting as well. These two all go together really, really well. And they are, they're the sort of paintings I love looking at because they kind of hurt my brain a little bit because I can't make sense of them. Um, because I'll look at them and my eye will be going around a little bit like it's drunk or something because it can't, 
it can't um, easily make sense of what I'm seeing, which I mm -hmm. think is a really good sign uh, because it means there's so much going on um, on lots of different levels that uh, it's so it kind of overloads my mind and bypasses it a little bit and I, and goes straight to I'm just kind of receiving them receiving the painting in uh, and feeling things inside and not really knowing why I'm feeling them and um, so yeah I think that's fantastic and um, and there, there's a huge breath like you're very you've you you've got a lot of work like there's a huge breadth of what you're of your output you know Con like considering you've got so much going on it's amazing you get to paint as much as you do so that's pretty impressive mm -hmm. as well and then yeah to what i was saying earlier on to like know a little bit about your story and to come through it so well and to come through it with such a, a lovely optimistic um life affirming um outlook that's beautiful as well and yeah it's been lovely kind of getting to know you a little bit as well find out what's going on behind the paintings thank you thank you very much very good uh, observation <laughs> oh thank you thank you okay well i keep in touch with everyone so i'm sure we'll keep in touch for um zoom tea or whatever but yeah we'll say goodbye for now goodbye thank you very much john for the beautiful nice interview i enjoyed it oh great thank you all right bye bye i've never felt this good in my entire life make me some spaghetti actually i'd prefer a cup of tea <laughs> a cup of tea would be lovely so yeah just a little reminder mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said you know what i've been listening to your podcast for ages and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great. I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton. Gently does it all one word or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimp. So buy us a drink. Come on.